play that out at the beginning. Um, so the eagle eye of you reading the report will will see that actually we said there were nine school inspections. I think because we'd reported to nine in the last report, actually there are more. There were an additional two that were in the summer since the last report. Um, so that makes 11 in total during the summer. Eight of those were section eight, and then there were three section fives. And then so far this autumn term, bearing in mind that we haven't got to the end of it, We've had six inspections to date. One of those was a section eight and five section fives that are full inspections, the graded ones. So you can see actually it appears in Portsmouth that there's been an emphasis of a change from Ofsted. And then there are more full graded inspections actually being undertaken than the ungraded ones where the grade can't actually change unless it's converted at that particular moment in time. So the, the table lays out about whether the schools in, from those section eights continue to be good, whether if it's a whole graded one for the overall effectiveness, whether the, the judgment has changed, whether it's good, um, outstanding, or if they've moved to a different judgment for overall effectiveness. So the bullet points there then talk about some of the individual schools. So St Edmunds had a section eight, retained its outstanding judgment while St John's, who were outstanding, had a full section five and moved from that outstanding overall effectiveness to good. But they did some of they did get good um, outstanding in some of those categories, so the behaviour and attitudes, personal development and early years, but uh, their overall effectiveness was, was judged to be good. And that inspection was led by a senior HMI, so, so very, very focused. Um, and then we've had a bit of a sort of swapping around. So we've had some schools that have gone from requires improvement and they've had a full graded inspection and, and moved to good, like Castleview and Westover, um, whilst um, two of our other schools have gone um, the other way around. They've moved from good to requires improvement. So you can see there's, there's a little bit of, of changing around. Um, and then another school Kings Academy Northern Parade Junior, the actual overall effectiveness judgment hasn't changed, but because it was an ungraded one, what's known well, for that section eight, um, it was known as what was known as an outcome three. So had it been a full inspection, it might not have stayed good. Therefore, it says when its next inspection's got to be. Um, so yeah, so so there's been a lot of inspecting going on. And for Ofsted, they, they committed that all schools between May 21 and July 25 will be inspected because obviously because of the pandemic, they built in that extension of often up to six terms. So we've laid out there um, how that sort of speeding up and how that inspection process is, is now, the timescales of it is changing. And also to bear in mind all of those outstanding schools were taken out of the framework are now back in this framework. So some of those schools that hadn't been inspected since like Neon Infant since 2009 have, have just recently been inspected. And obviously on the table, it, it shows that actually some of the reports aren't in yet. So we're awaiting those. Brilliant, Debbie, thank you so much. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think I need to really add anything to that. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything or got any questions. I'm assuming not. It's a standard report which just describes the activity and the outcomes. Um, I, I suppose it, it does show that the resource has been invested at a central government level to actually go ahead and achieve what they said that they were going to do in terms of getting around to all schools. Uh, it very much looks like that, doesn't it, the, with the speed at which it's happening. Okay, so the next item is um, item six. And that is Portsmouth data for 2022. And I believe Mike is reading this. Yeah, and it might be, I know you've got a copy of the report, but it might be useful if I just share the mm -hmm. presentation. So it just helps me then go through um, each slide and it'll be fairly brief. Um, but if I just bring that up, just bear with me. Hopefully you can see that. We can, Mike. Thank you. Good. OK. Um, right. So I'll just run through this. So, yeah, these are headlines of the data from uh, 2022. Um, 
and uh, there are some caveats, and I'll come on to those later. But uh, just to a bit of background, and you've heard this kind of scenario before. So we talk about the Boston paradox, the fact that most of our schools are are good or or better, um, which you know does does reflect um, you know the good quality of education and inclusive practice in, in classrooms across our schools, but. Uh, if we look at outcomes uh, at the end of key stage two and key stage four, we are we are well below where we need to be, um, and in the bottom decile nationally for most performance measures. And as we go through the 2022 data, uh, what is clear is that hasn't changed. And in fact, uh, what you will see is the gap between ourselves and national has, across a number of measures, widened. So um, so that paradox still firmly remains. But in fact, the picture is probably a little bit more worrying based on 2022 data, but there are caveats which I'll come on to in a moment. Uh, that's a bit of context, um, just in terms of the, the education landscape, um, the, the number of schools that are in maths, uh, numbers of people's on roll, a um, bit about deprivation. So I won't go through all of that, but it's just a, a bit of context there for you. Um, the caveat is um, DfE themselves have advised on, on caution when comparing schools' performance in 21-22 with um, the last set of sort of validated results um, before we'd had to go through teacher assess results uh, back in 2019 um, and making those comparisons with, with national uh, and uh, LA averages. I've done some of that comparison in this presentation, but as I say, uh, you've got to be really cautious about that. And that's because of the, the uneven impact the pandemic had on pupils and schools across, across um, the country. And that's particularly the case in Portsmouth, we saw a very uneven distribution. We know that some schools were, were really badly affected last year due to staff absence, for example, as well as people absence as a result of the pandemic, um, and, and obviously the impact of the pandemic um, bef before then. Um, so yeah, a lot of caution with these results, but nevertheless, um, I think it's important we share them, them with you. So I'll just start with um, primary and uh, starting with a year one phonics screening check, uh, which we do. Um, uh, and these are the figures of 2022. And as is the case across the country, those figures have dipped. Um, and we saw a significant dip in Portsmouth down to 67% of the expected standard. Um, and you can see that gap between ourselves and national, national being the red line, has increased. Uh, one thing just worth commenting on um, uh, as I go through these slides, what you will have seen previously up to 2019 was generally a trajectory of improvement where we were either closing the gap on national law or at least keeping it fairly stable. Um, what we see in these 22 figures is obviously a significant dip as we've seen across the country, but in most cases a widening of that gap between ourselves and national. Uh, then we go on to key stage one reading, um, and there again you see that dip um, down to from 73 to 63% expected, um, and that gap um, between ourselves and national widening. Writing uh, similar, down to 50%, and maths again a dip there, uh, down to 63%, although the gap there is not so so wide. That's at key stage one. If we go on to key stage two, um, this is the combined um, score for reading, writing, maths at expected standard. Um, that dropped from 58% to 48%, so a 10 percentage point drop uh, compared to the 2019 figures. Um, and you can see there a slight widening of the gap between ourselves and national. There are some positive stories in here. So I'll start with the most positive one. And this, I think, reflects uh, some of the work that Debbie was referring to earlier. And this is around Key Stage 2 reading, where, in fact, we uh, the figure was increased from 67% back in um 2019 up to 70% and you can see we've actually closed um, the gap between ourselves and national that was that was really positive and uh, we are hoping that will continue into next year of course um, less positive is writing um, which we saw across all our schools actually this was not uh, so uneven um, and there you can see the gap uh, widening uh, between ourselves and national and maths has also was a concern again we've, we've been on a trajectory of improvement so we'd, we'd got up to 75% in 2019, we're, we're down at 63% in 2022. So those were the, the key headlines from primary. Uh, just talking about GCSE figures, and again, these uh, these are provisional still, um, but uh, again, a bit of caution here um, in terms of these figures. Um, we've just there given some background about 
the fact that exams were cancelled in 2020 and 21 due to the pandemic um, and of course we awarded uh, teacher assessed grades uh, for those for those years and those those results are certainly not comparable um, the results in 2022 um, worth just noting that Ofqual announced um, that the approach the board's exam boards would be taking in 2022 would reflect a midpoint between the summer of 2019 and uh, summer of 21 and results in summer 22 would therefore be higher when the summer exams were last set in 2019 but no lower than 21 so so you need to bear that in mind um, in terms of these results which we were expecting to be be higher as a result of that announcement uh, so these are the results for 2022 the headlines and we've made we have provided a comparison to 2019 and we saw you know significant um, uh, increases in terms of the standard pass um, in both English and maths um, and there you've got that figure of 61 percent and then the uh, single figures for English and maths 72 and 65 respectively um, and then we look at the strong pass which is, is grade five and above um, and there again we've made uh, significant increases even more so in terms of the strong passes uh, English and maths at 41 uh, percent and then English 57 and maths at 47 percent so that was pleasing to see but as you'll see later on if you compare this to national um, that gap looks to have widened so uh, let's just have a look at the standard pass in English and maths um, so those are uh, we've, you've got the trend data there from 2016 to 2019 where you were seeing um, a slight decline um, in 2022 um, again with all the caveats I've just mentioned and the fact these these results will be probably higher than uh, what they will be uh, next year we're at 61 percent um, and there you've got the national figure at 69 percent so that gap um, has clearly actually it hasn't widened that much to be honest but um, it, it's still a fairly uh, wide gap um, and if we go on to the next one so strong pass in English and maths uh, as I say we're down at 41 percent but that is an increase uh, from 2019 um, we've seen similar increases across the country and the national figure is at 50 percent so that gap has slightly widened uh, in terms of English and maths strong pass uh, average entertainment eight score we've given there again an increase there we're up to 43.2 um, the national is 48.8 so again you know fair, a fair gap there it's a similar gap to where we were in 2019 and progress eight uh, score at, we're at now at minus 0 0.35 that's an improvement on 2019 um, and the national is at minus 0 0.13 and there you can you know we have actually uh, narrowed that gap between ourselves and national so those were the the headlines for GCSE performance. Um, just a few other uh, headlines worth just reflecting on. Um, as you know, we we track post-16 participation, um, 16 and 17 year olds, um, and there we have given the uh, neat percentages. So those are those young people who are not in education, employment, and training. That the there's an overall figure that's calculated, which takes into account the neat figure and also. Uh, the percentage of unknowns uh, so our overall figure is 5.2 percent if we just take the neat figure uh, it's 3.8 percent which is above national where you you probably you would expect that to be uh, given the um, challenges within Portsmouth um, but we're slightly above our stat neighbors but um, but that figure has come down significantly from where we were a number of years ago and our unknowns is still very low um, uh, because we we robustly track um, our young people across Portsmouth uh, and therefore that neat figure 3.8 percent is we you know is a very accurate figure whereas uh, other local authorities who have higher levels of unknowns um, their, their neat figures are perhaps a little bit shaky um, whereas we can have complete confidence in ours um, attendance obviously is something we track and I've just given the national data here which uh, the last set of sort of national data from the autumn and spring terms are from 21-22 uh, all of that all of that was up because of the pandemic and because of the significant absence that we were seeing across the country um, overall absence there at 8.1 percent for the city council for the local authority area uh, national 7.3 um, persistent absence which uh, which is a, a concern um, was at 24 percent uh, just above uh, national um, 
that has come down significantly and, and the, the data we get from from live data to the study bugs data that we have is, is showing a significant improvement on those figures but that's obviously uh, being replicated across the country and we'll be we'll be reviewing that very closely as we go forward uh, this year in terms of our attendance strategy and I think that probably covers it so that is a very brief run through uh, the data um, from 2022 with all the caveats that I've just mentioned. Thank you Mike, um, that's uh, very detailed and I think is very stark in, in, the, in the presentation of it. I think really the next year or two is going to really put the proper context on stuff in, in many ways as you've kind of alluded to that um, we were beginning to close some gaps but we are, um, you know, a poor, a poor city which was impacted by the pandemic, and therefore it's not surprising that some of those um, those impacts seem to be showing through. However, there are where we seem to have uh, focused, and like I go back to the kind of the reading focus that we specifically decided that we were going to prioritise. There are there's some really really positive results there. So um, yeah more work to do we know yep. that um, yeah, we're, we're not a priority education investment area for nothing I was about to, yeah. I was about <laughs> to say that I'm sure we're going to come on to the, that yep. for the last report um, but um, just before we do that is there anyone who wants to make any further comment or ask any questions of it but I think it was very thorough and it, you know very explicit in terms of the data which is what it um, said on the tin so um, thank you for that report I mean as Julie noted and that leads us on nicely as you segue yourself into the final report which is um, yes based on that it's not no surprise that we have um, been identified as a priority education investment area and I know a lot of work has gone on to putting up the plans for that so I shall hand back to you yep okay so I'll just take you through um, the report and just uh, highlight uh, key aspects of this report and uh, give you a, a, a latest update in terms of where we are uh, because when we wrote this report uh, this was prior to the, the, the meeting of the PEP strategic board. We've since had that meeting and we've since submitted the delivery plan so I will just give a, a brief update on where we are currently. So in terms Mike, of background... Can I just say you're still sharing your other screen? Oh am I? Yeah. Uh, right, I apologise. I'll stop That's sharing. That's okay. Just, uh... Yeah, no thank you for pointing okay. out. I thought I'd got rid of it. Is that gone now? Yes, it has. I can't, I can't see that on my screen, so it doesn't, oh. um, it's, uh, doesn't show. Right, OK, I'll go back to the report. Um, yeah, so a bit of background. So um, in the levelling up white paper back in February 22, the government um, identified 55 education investment areas. Uh, and we were one of those. Uh, they then subsequently, when the white paper was released in March 2022, identified uh, 24 priority areas from those 55. Um, and that included the existing opportunity areas which have been going for three years or so um, uh, there are 12 of those and then 12 new um, uh, priority education investment areas of which we were one of those and in fact we're the only one um, of in terms of a new education investment area in the southeast the only other that exists which is an opportunity area is Hastings um, so spotlight very much on us. Um, I've included there the government's ambition uh, by, 2020, by 2030 in terms of what the white paper said, which is incredibly ambitious given the figures I've just presented. So 90% of pupils meeting the expected standard in reading, writing and maths combined at key stage two. And bear in mind where we are, we're well below, we're below 50. So that is uh, that's quite a challenge. And then also the national GCSE average grade in both English and language and, uh, and, and in maths increasing from 4.5 to 5. Um, those are the targets the government has set. Um, the government has, has allocated, as well as um, focusing on those priority education investment areas in terms of many of the government programmes that currently exist, so giving these areas um, higher priority and therefore uh, greater levels of elig eligibility, they've also uh, allocated some uh, additional funding, £42 million in total, to address local needs in those areas. Um, and that provides for bespoke uh, interventions which meet uh, local need. They have to be, um, in, the, in the DFC's words, sort of evidence-based so that, we're, that, that it's clear that what we're proposing has the potential to have impact. 
um, but it is it is meant to be bespoke and, and local. So that was welcome. Um, but there's a process uh, behind this to try and access this funding, which has been uh, onerous to say the least. Um, so uh, the process, the, the first thing we need to do is set up a local partnership board um, to act in an advisory capacity. Well, we were already there in that respect because we've got the the Ports and Education Partnership Board, um, you know, which has been going for some time now, and we have a, a very strong structure sitting behind that. So we we put forward that uh, uh, we wanted to use that that mechanism, and we uh, adapted our terms of reference to fit with the requirements of the local partnership boards, and that was accepted by the DFE. Um, we then also, um, underneath that that board, set up a subgroup with uh, representatives from across um, the board, and that included Matt, uh, the Teaching School Hub, uh, Diocese and the local authority, and that board was tasked, that group was tasked with um, three uh, key areas of work. First was a, a data-led analysis to look at what the key issues were, and that reflects some of the data I've presented uh, earlier. From that, uh, we had to then identify three to four local improvement priorities which we completed, and I'll come on to that in a moment. And then from that, we had to start to work up a delivery plan, which included all those interventions I've just referred to. Um, and we had to demonstrate that those interventions would directly impact on the key requirements the DfE were looking for, which is around improved attainment and progress, particularly at the end of Key Stage 2 and at the end of Key Stage 4. And that delivery plan had to be submitted by the end of November, when in fact it had to be submitted uh, last Tuesday. Um, so uh, that, that was the task ahead of us, a very tight timetable, and it's fair to say when we started this task, we didn't know what the budget was, we didn't really know what the guidance was, so we were working slightly blind, and over the course of the last two or three months, um, we've had guidance being drip-fed to us, um, sometimes conflicting guidance. Um, which which has been a challenge, I think it's fair to say, but we've risen to it and we've delivered. Um, uh, and as I say, we've we've just submitted that delivery plan. Um, just to um, clarify what the four local improvement priorities uh, are, and that was agreed. So the first one was around early communication, language and literacy, and this is um, one of our priorities of the, of the PEP strategy, uh, which we've been working on, and obviously we've just heard about some of the positive impacts that's had around reading. Uh, the second uh, priority was around maths. Now that was that hasn't some that hasn't hasn't been a priority which has appeared in our in our education strategy for the last three years. Partly because we were on a very strong trajectory of improvement, and um, and we had seen some significant investment through the Solent Maths Hub um, around this priority. So um, it wasn't felt in in the past to to be something which should feature strongly within our education strategy. But given the results we've seen more recently. Uh, and given how important maths is in terms of um, uh, pupils' uh, progress and access to post-16, we felt we needed to to um, in, you know reinstate that as a priority. So that is our second priority. Our third one, no surprises here, is around school attendance. Um, and obviously, we we already have a strategy in place to improve school attendance and reduce um, suspensions. And our fourth one, which overlaps with the other three. Um, is around um, work that will focus on on particular underperforming groups, and that included children eligible for free school meals, so our disadvantaged children, uh, boys, but particularly white British boys, and pupils with SEND, particularly those pupils who are in mainstream and who are on SEN support. We know those groups underperform, particularly when you compare that with their with their peers and with with national averages. So those are the four priorities we took forward. Over the last um, a month or so, we've been working on the delivery plan, and this has been a, a significant piece of work. Um, and the original guidance was was asking for quite a lot of detail, um, um, and we set that out. We've had we've had uh, many many conversations. The subgroup has kind of split into four, working on those four priorities. Um, uh, we've had lots of discussions with some of the key partners that will be delivering some of those interventions, um, and we got to the point. Uh, on Tuesday where we were able to submit that, that final plan. Um, I'd like to be able to tell you what's going to happen next in terms of when we will get the green light, uh, when we can access that funding, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but I, but I can't tell you that because uh, that's still not clear. All I have been told by the DfE and the Regions Group is those plans now 
are going to be submitted. It won't be the detailed plan that we submitted to ministers. What they're going to be doing is extracting from our plan the headlines and the costs, and that will that will be going forward to to ministers um, over the course of the next few weeks. I hope that before Christmas we will we will get some feedback on that delivery plan, so we are in a position to start implementation from January. But um, but I don't know is the is the short answer. I think that just about covers the summary. Um, I, I'm very happy to share with um, uh, board members the, the copy of the delivery plan now because that has now gone. Um, but um, the, I suppose the caveat to that is there could be further iterations depending on the feedback we get. Thanks, Mike. Can I, I just got one question that I'm checking. So the money is for three years and we're halfway through year one and we haven't, we don't know about the money. Correct. Just checking. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it'll be interesting to know when we do get it. Yeah. And presumably, it, 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 if it comes towards the end of the first year, you'll still have that money. They won't. Ex will they extend it for? A... We they haven't know. said that yet. All, all they said so far is that the money is confirmed. It's not going to be taken away. I mean, that was a worry, you know, given the yeah. the, the political turmoil we've seen and the changes yeah. in government. So, I mean. Yeah. Uh, um, and and you know the the the, uh, the autumn statement. We we were concerned that that funding would disappear, but but no, we've had confirmation though that's in there. The treasury won't be taking that back. So, um, but we've had no no other guidance around whether there would be any sort of form of extension at the moment. They're working on the basis of those three years and the fact that we're we're you know we're nearly halfway through the first. Yeah, no, I was just but the reason I I make that point here in this forum is because. I, I've seen obviously the detail of the submission and mm. there's a lot of um, hoops to jump through and detail to work through so if you're asked to cost particular schemes of work which are going to be done over a period of time if the money suddenly comes through in May you, you can't then teach a year's worth of whatever it is that you plan to do in the last few weeks of time it's no. just not practicable so on the one hand, it's about keeping the money, and we all know that money is lovely to have. But actually, if you've gone to the mm. the extent that we have in saying this is how it's going to be spent over a 10-week intervention program or whatever it is, you can't just suddenly forget the timeline, can you? So no. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be following this one with curiosity, um, yeah. even though there's a promise that we'll keep the money. Um, yeah. But thank you to... Yeah, yeah, and I, I think you make a fair point because if 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 it does take a long time before we we get that money coming through, then I think we've got a pretty good case to say, yeah. look, we can't do that over just two years now. Can could we then run into exactly. a, a third year? So yeah, I'm, if, I'm sure that yeah. I'm sure there's a lot a lot more discussion to I'm follow. Sure. But yeah, it, I mean, and the reason I highlight that um, is is actually that's the only way to do it properly if you really care about the outcomes of children. Yeah. If you just care about ticking a box to say we gave that money to that education you know the money's gone in mm. I mean that's a whole different thing isn't it if we genuinely want to make long term impact then we have to do it in the most professional way we know how to do it anyway as you say um, it, you've done you're, you and the officers have done and the other people who on the PET have done a really good job at thinking this through in great detail and um, you know we have to be grateful that we've got this injection of money and we'll do the best we can with it for, for kids in the city so yeah. thank you to you and your team for doing that um, does anyone want to, else want to add anything to that report Helen you don't want to say anything all right yeah you look, I can see you nodding and stuff on the on the most important points <laughs> Um, so that's that, and I think that's the last item on the agenda, except to say that the next meeting is, I just found, I've got to find it on my phone again now. Um, um, can you help me, Anna? I did yeah, just read the, it. It's the 2nd of March, just go. double check. Thursday the 2nd of March at 4pm. And... Um, I know there's only Helen here who's not an officer, but I'm assuming we're still happy to do these. Or, um, we don't have to do them in person. For the as, ed, uh, for as this. far as we know, this could still continue virtually yeah. unless there's any change. Are people happy to continue it virtually? I am. Okay. All right, then. I think that's that can be a decision that's made. All right. Thank you very much to everyone who's attended. Um, you have over an hour back. 
um, I'm sure everyone will dive into their emails. Um, thank you very much. Anna, you can turn it off now. The light. Well, okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Bye. Helen. Thanks, Bye. everyone, for coming. Thank you. And my apologies for okay. lateness. Technical incompatibility.